This section summarizes some of the practical aspects of staffing and skills required for deploying safely. A practical consideration in creating a highly automated vehicle is that it is an exceptionally complex piece of equipment mechanically, but also from a computer-based system point of view. It's inevitable that different pieces will be put together from different vendors and different supply chains. And the question is, when all those pieces are put together, will the system actually work? This is where system engineering comes in. System engineering will be a required core competence for any company assembling an automated vehicle. This is true even if they make all the pieces themselves because there will inevitably be different design teams that have to collaborate and coordinate. System engineering includes system level design, such as requirements management and definitions of architectures for hardware, for software, for power distribution, and so on. It also includes system integration, each component or each architectural element will have interfaces, and those interfaces have to be matched up so that the overall system works properly. That includes sensors and software and hardware and so on. There will also be significant effort required simply to tame the complexity of integrating so many different pieces in addition to whatever supplier management is required. There will be internal and external suppliers of components that all have to be hooked together, and there will be requirements allocated to each component that need to be assembled and integrated and linked to both component test plans and system level test plans. Closely related to system engineering is computer-based system safety engineering. Safety engineering deals with the question as to whether the resultant system will be acceptably safe. Safety engineering activities include identifying hazards and mitigation strategies. Typically, this proceeds with some sort of hazard analysis, the identification of safety concepts, and then making sure that high-risk hazards are mitigated so that the system will be acceptably safe, and then validating that the acceptable safety has indeed been achieved. The goal of safety engineering is to ensure acceptable safety, this includes identifying safety requirements, in other words, what does safe actually mean, and then making sure that the mitigation techniques have resulted in acceptable safety. It's important to realize that safety qualification includes not only component safety qualification and assessing the safety of the whole system, but also safety qualification of tools that are used to design the system to make sure that no systematic defects are inserted by the tool chain or that no systematic gaps and requirements exist due to defects in requirements management tools and so on. Another piece of safety engineering is ensuring that there's a robust safety culture, including having a safety management system, SMS, and ensuring conformance to relevant safety standards. Safety culture includes not only the design process, but also ensuring robust safety practices across design, deployment, and operations. Given that system and safety engineering are critically important to the success of launching a life-critical system, the question is, how much is that going to cost? This pie chart shows a typical staffing profile for a more traditional automotive software project. There may be significant variation from this pie chart depending on the exact approach used for an autonomous system, but nonetheless, it's a starting point to set expectations. For a generic life-critical embedded software project, one would expect to see about 40% of the effort in integration and system test. For an automated vehicle, this would include a lot of the simulation campaign effort and the road testing as well. About 20% of the effort would be in development testing, that includes peer review, unit test, automated build tests, and so on. About 25% of the effort would be in actual development, design, and implementation. For machine learning-based system, this would include collecting the data and training models. About 2.5% of the entire effort would be for safety engineering, and about 7.5% of the effort would be for system engineering, with system and safety engineering aggregated to be about 10%, and sometimes the line between system and safety engineering moving around a little bit inside that 10%. The last 5% slice is SQA, Software Quality Assurance, which is the function that designs, trains, and monitors the performance of procedures to ensure overall software quality. 
Importantly, SQA is about the quality and health of the design process and not about actually testing the software. While it would be no surprise if the percentages move around potentially considerably from project to project, especially with machine learning-based system design, eventually the SQA system engineering and safety engineering functions have to maintain about that percentage for the teams to be successful. We interviewed a number of very experienced people and uniformly they said that if system safety and SQA get squeezed, the resulting product quality simply is not there. There are a number of technical safety challenges that need to be addressed to produce safe, highly automated vehicles. A significant challenge is building acceptable perception and prediction systems, and in particular, ensuring the safety of machine learning-based functions that are often used to implement perception and prediction. It's likely that more than simple object motion tracking will be required for many of these automated vehicle applications. Consider, for example, this deer at the side of the road. The deer is currently standing still, and a motion tracking-based predictor would say, well, it's still now, and it's going to remain still. But any experienced rural driver knows that the thing that happens next is the deer waits till the car is almost on top of it and then runs in front of the car. A prudent driver would realize that this is a highly risky situation and would reduce vehicle speed when approaching the deer based on the prediction that the deer is likely to run in front of the car. This kind of sophistication in object classification and being able to hypothesize what happens next will require a high degree of sophistication and will also apply to urban situations in which there are pedestrians on the edge of a sidewalk. An ability to ensure that predictions are robust enough to achieve acceptable safety remains a significant challenge in the field. Another technical safety challenge is properly executing a safety of the intended function, SODIF, design process. A simplistic version of SODIF is to drive, find a problem, fix it, drive some more, and iterate until you have lots and lots of testing miles on real-world conditions. For example, Waymo has said they've done 6 million test miles, but only 65,000 deployed miles. If you're testing orders of magnitude more miles than you're deployed, then you can make an argument that the testing will have seen pretty much everything that is likely to happen during those few miles of deployment. But to deploy at scale, at some point, you'll need to have real deployed miles beyond the number of real-world test miles. Sure, simulation can help to a degree, but only if the simulation and the scenarios in the simulation and the objects in the simulation can account for all the things that are likely to happen in the real world. An issue that is not addressed by this set of standards is, how do you know when you're done identifying weird things that will happen in the real world and it's time to deploy at scale? Answering that question for large fleets is likely to involve UL4600 concepts and safety cases that go beyond, here's what we've seen, let's deal with it, and argue to completeness that all the likely hazards have been identified and addressed, whether or not they were seen in system-level testing. At a higher level, a significant technical safety challenge is getting from works okay to safe. You can brute force your way into the first few nines. And by that, I mean, if 99% of the time your perception system works, you can do that by brute force testing. But you can't get all the nines you need. You can't get from 99% to 99.99 bunch and bunch and bunch of nines to life critical number of nines. You can't do that with brute force because it's simply too expensive you'll need to use some sort of simulation-based effort and then apply an argument that the simulation actually gives you the number of nines and all the other parts of positive trust balance. Especially, you'll need field feedback into safety cases to know that you've deployed safely at scale. Even after you've done all the engineering rigor and validation that you think is required, you'll also need field feedback based on your safety case to ensure that your safety case is valid and that you notice and respond to changes in the outside world that were not considered at design time. Addressing organizational safety challenges is every bit as important as addressing technical challenges. There has been significant pressure to deploy and in response, there was a flurry of empty driver's seat demos in late 2020. Some of those empty driver's seat demos were hopefully from teams that thought they were ready to deploy. 
but some of them might have been from teams that felt pressure to show a demo before the end of the calendar year to meet milestones, funding deadlines, or for other reasons that we're really not about we're ready to deploy safely, but rather we have to deploy because a certain date has arrived. This leads to the question, can the teams take the time they need to really be safe? Another organizational safety challenge has to do with industry transparency. Right now, the industry for automated vehicles is notorious for not wanting to share any information outside the organization. At some point, the airline industries realized that they needed to collaborate to achieve industry safety rather than compete. Long term, the automotive industry will also need to collaborate on safety, and the question is how long it will take that industry to get there. One of the reasons to collaborate on safety and have transparency is to maintain public trust in the face of an adverse news event. Eventually, there will be large profile adverse news events involving this technology. And the question will be, will the public have enough trust that the industry can ride through those news events? Or will the public trust have been so eroded that it only takes one bad news event to significantly impair the industry? The answer to that question is up to the industry and how much transparency it displays before any adverse news event has a chance to occur. Finally, it's important to ensure a robust safety culture in the companies building and operating the technology. There are some culture clashes going on behind the scenes that are relevant to this. A significant one is the robotics culture, which is traditionally a research and low-scale operation culture, meeting the automotive engineering culture. The roboticists understand the advanced technology, but for the most part have very little experience in high-scale deployment safety. The automotive engineering culture has experience in high-scale safety, but does not necessarily understand the complex technology behind vehicle automation. A related but different set of cultures that are meeting are the Silicon Valley move fast and break things culture, which is not accustomed to building systems that have life critical safety implications, with the automotive culture, which is accustomed to life critical safety, but it's traditionally relied on having a human driver to clean up any loose ends. Both of those cultures put together are then combined with no human driver to clean up the loose ends, significantly changing the approach that's required for safety on top of the need to merge those two rather different development cultures. Getting from a vehicle that performs well on demos to a product that can be deployed at scale requires significant effort and attention to factors such as software quality, system engineering, and safety engineering. In particular, getting there is going to require about 10% of the resources to be spent on system and safety engineering staff. It will require resolving open technical safety challenges and will also crucially require establishing and maintaining a robust safety culture. 